Welcome to Dr. Jeremy England, renowned physicist, author of Every Life is on Fire, currently a machine learning researcher in the biotech industry here in Israel. My pleasure to be here as always. So uh, we're following on now a series of shiurim that are, are connected with korbanot, with burnt offerings of uh, various kinds that are to be brought in, in Beit HaMikdash, in the temple. Uh, and I, I don't think we'll keep on zooming into higher and higher resolution, but last time we talked about what perhaps the role of animals in burnt offerings might be, like why it could be necessary, well, what does it accomplish to involve animals in, in burnt offerings? Why can't you just uh, do things vegetarian? Uh, and this time I wanted to zoom in even a little bit more and ask about the importance of, or the centrality of sheep uh, in the, the Torah's laws uh, of burnt offerings. And I think that you, you could, even before saying why sheep, you could say why these animals and not those, meaning that sheep ha have a, a particularly central role to play uh, in the laws of burnt offerings because of what's called the olat tamid, the, the twice daily offering that is the bedrock of all the other less frequent and sometimes more contingent or optional kinds of offerings that you can bring. So there's this whole elaborate structure of laws and rules and different kinds of uh, rituals involving the temple and the, the priesthood, which uh, may involve birds or other kinds of mammals. Uh, but it is fair to say that sheep are at the core of this because the thing that you are always going to do, no matter what, rain or shine, every day, is So you have one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the evening or in the afternoon. Um, uh, that is going to be the ola, uh, the burnt offering, the fully consumed burnt offering uh, that's brought, shaharit in the morning, minha in the afternoon. Uh, and... Everything else is either less frequent than that or, or, or somehow more dependent on whether someone committed an avera, a transgression, or whether uh, perhaps they want to bring a korban toda because they want to give thanks uh, for some way that Hashem saved them, perhaps from illness or on a sea voyage. So what is it about, first of all, the particular kinds of animals that we, we bring in korbanot, right? Like there are, there are many species of animals, and even if we said somehow you can bring these uh you 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 need to bring animals of some kind for sacrifice why would it not be the case that you could bring any animal that was somehow worth something to you so horses may not be kasher for eating by people but it's certainly a valuable animal uh, and if we're talking about sacrifice as giving up something that belongs to you and we have that sort of basic notion and that may be not a totally correct notion, but it's at least part of the story, perhaps. Um, you're, you're giving up something that's worth something to you. You're bringing it to Hashem. Why couldn't you bring a horse, right? Because that's certainly showing you're willing to give up things of value to you. And it is an animal, so it has a lot of the, and it's a mammal even, so it has a lot in common with the biology of people. But horses are not um, sacrificial animals. Uh, and certainly things like iguanas or chimps or whatever else, you can imagine many animals that are right out, that there's, there's no... Uh, possibility of, of their being involved. Uh, and so from one standpoint, you could say, okay, fine, but that's just like asking the question over again of why the laws of kashrut are what they are. Why are certain animals kasher um, and, and others are not? Uh, but that may be flipping things around to some degree because the whole idea of eating animals uh, is perhaps a little bit questionable in the Torah uh, until late in the game outside of the context of korbanot, of, of burnt offerings. Uh, it is clear that the laws of the Torah create the possibility of people keeping the Torah and eating animals in the context of Beit HaMikdash. And eventually the Torah also adds on, and if you're very far, from, far away from the Mikdash and you have this tava, you have this craving to eat meat, then you can uh, slaughter animals in your gates and you must pour the blood on the ground and all of those things. So it becomes this, this thing you can do out in other contexts. But there is a sense in which the fundamental idea uh, is that we're going to uh, think of eating animals as originating through our, our uh, relationship to Mikdash. And, and then we, we learn about what else is possible from that example. 
So I don't think it's so much the question we necessarily should be asking of, well, can we understand the laws of Kashrut and then we'll understand why these particular animals uh, can be brought as sacrifices because they are the kosher animals. You could flip around and say, why are these the animals that are suitable for a burnt offerings like a pigeon or a dove uh, or a cow or a sheep or a goat? Uh, but that's a pretty short list. And, you know, there may be a few kind of varietals that basically resemble that list that you could also include. But even like a deer, which is kasher, you can't, you don't bring offerings of a deer at any point. Um, and, and, and there aren't a lot of other things that go on the list. So why those animals in particular are, are the ones that Akados Baruch Hu wants us to bring offerings from? And then maybe we'll understand something about kashrut, uh, and, or, you know, or maybe not. I, I, to some degree, we don't have to uh, involve those two issues together. Because I, I do want to really get to sheep today, mainly, but I think you could um, you could start by saying some things that are a little bit more general to sheep, and you just say, all right, the big ticket items, and, you know, because birds is kind of a, a simpler and, and separate thing, but the big ticket items for burnt offerings, the animals that we're talking about, are these mammals that chew their cud and have split hooves, which gives you a list of goats and sheep and cows. Those are domesticated split hooved cud chewing mammals uh, and everything else is really more peripheral uh, and it's still true that sheep are the are, are the central animal because of the olat um, and and you could argue other things like korban pesach that play this really pivotal role somehow but you could still say all right let's lump in cows and ask the question why these animals what's significant like especially if you're comparing to a horse What's the difference between a horse, which has hooves that just happen not to be split, but it does chew cud after a fashion, you know, it eats grass or hay or whatever, um, and, and, and just not suitable, or, you know, a, a donkey, etc. like those types of, of mammals, what's so unsuitable about them? Um, and I think that perhaps by that example, you can start to sense that at least part of the story here is that it's about these herd animals. Um, and, 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 and these animals where they are domesticated, they live in herds, they are relatively docile. And, and you could argue that maybe, you know, cows and bulls can sometimes very much not be, but still, you know, cows in comparison uh, with other mammals, uh, like wild horses, for example, they don't seem extremely ferocious. They, they do spend a lot of their time seemingly just chewing grass and sort of waiting for their life to run to the end of the conveyor belt. Uh, and there, there is an element of this that I think is fairly basic uh, with, with uh, sacrifices that somehow what this is about is just the, and maybe I shouldn't use the word sacrifice, but burnt offerings, you know, korban notes. So that the basic, the most basic idea perhaps is that it's about that these are animals that lead a very serene, and somewhat boring existence as domesticated species that are well managed in herds, um, and they will walk to the slaughter. Right? It's a bit harder to get uh, a bull uh, to go to the slaughter, uh, but in comparing to, let's say, a bear or something like that, uh, it, it, it's a more straightforward thing, uh, and certainly was an achievable thing. And and I think that that may be actually presaged or or pointed at in this really interesting moment. Uh, in the life of Yitzhak Avinu, this famous moment where Yaakov is stealing the blessing of Esav, his brother. Uh, and we think of that piece of narrative as really being about the family relationships that are involved. And it seems to fade into the background sort of, oh, it so happens that Yaakov is preparing a meal for his father. Um, and that that's part somehow of how Yaakov tricks his father, if you believe that he was being tricked, but that that whole pageant that's that's performed, where Yaakov brings food to Yaakov and uh, sorry to Yitzchak, uh, and and receives a blessing from him, that it so happens to involve a meal. It is interesting, however, that that moment is counterposing the hunt, right? Because Esav is a hunter, so he's this man who's going to go out in the field and through his ingenuity catch a wild animal like. Uh, a, a deer, a buck, let's say, um, and then bring it in, you know, capture it, presumably perform kosher slaughter on it after capturing it alive, um, and, and then prepare it as a meal for his father. 
And what happens instead is that Rivka Imenu, the, the mother of, of Yaakov and Esav, says to Yaakov, whom she's trying to help, why don't you go and, and do this with some domesticated animals instead? And that gives Yaakov a jump on Esav, right? He can do it more easily. It is easier to bring domesticated herd animals like sheep and goats and cows to the slaughter than it is uh, to bring wild game. Uh, and, and so therefore there's kind of an, an efficiency and an ease that's achieved. And, and you see clearly the meal itself is not a burnt offering, but there's something in the iconography of the moment that's a little bit pagan where the way that pagans bring offerings to their gods in, recept in, in, in exchange for receiving uh, a, a blessing, right? That's the hope of the pagan transaction. There's something that the text is playing with that is parodying that transaction because there's a competition to bring the right kind of food to Yitzhak in this case in order to get his blessing. Um, and you see this way where domesticated kosher animals are winning out over wild animals um, and herding is winning out over hunting. So that's an aside, but I think what it may point to is that perhaps the most basic point you can make about kosher sacrificial or kosher Korban's suitable animals uh, is that they are herd animals that can easily be brought to slaughter. Um, and so if we're going to do a lot of this, then this is what makes sense. Uh, and and I, I think that there's an additional layer you can easily get to when you think about especially sheep, but you know, to a lesser extent, cows perhaps, but still I think they fit into this category. There is another twin set of commentaries that are sort of opposite that you can now layer on top where you say, why would it be the case that there's something for me to learn from here in what kinds of animals they are and what, the, what their characteristics are that teaches me something that I'm going to absorb through repeated observation uh, of uh, these burnt offerings being brought when I, when I see these animals slaughtered and turned into burnt offerings in the meat mikdash. And I think on the one hand, you could say, well, part of what this is showing you is some kind of attitude that that we're meant to learn from the animal, let's say, that at the end of the day, especially sheep and, and perhaps even cows, you know, bulls maybe are a harder sale to make in this point, um, but that there's a certain submissiveness about them, right? That they're willing, we can lead them by the nose, so to speak, um, and, and they can become burnt offerings and they, they're not fighting tooth and nail the whole way. Uh, you're not sort of spearing a, a woolly mammoth uh, in the wild, uh, but rather the animals to a large degree cooperate. And that does, if we identify with them, right, especially if they're part of like a, a, a korban chatat, like a sin offering, and we see the animal as going in our place because we've done wrong with the animal, so to speak, is being punished, then that certainly reminds us of a kind of bida, a, a characteristic that we are perhaps trying to learn from the animal, this kind of willingness to ultimately submit to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will, that if it is his will, that according to his law, that we should be, so to speak, the Korban, then who are we to question that? But we make a pageant of this using the animals rather than actually becoming Korban not ourselves. So that, that comes back to this idea of the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac, that Hashem doesn't want human sacrifices, but there is this element of willingness to fully give over to his judgment that uh, the substitution of an animal for a human sacrifice uh, captures better um, if, we, if the animal is there to sort of teach us the willingness and the submissiveness uh, to his will. And I, so that's, a, that's a, I think, a commonly made point about sacrifices and certainly something you see in the Akedah. But I think you could make an opposite point about that same example because there's a, there's a different way of looking at it, which is when Hashem tells us in the Torah that certain animals are kasher and other animals are not kasher, is that good news for those animals or bad news for them? Meaning that on the one hand, we think if something is kasher, then it's kind of, it's not profane and we, we have a less negative association with it as though, because it's more acceptable to us, we set it on a, a higher level. And yet on the other hand, these animals are getting killed and eaten by us, right? Like, a, I, I think I've remarked to people before about the chazirei bar that you find in the north uh, of Eretz Israel, the, the sort of wild boars uh, in, in the sort of chaparral hills or whatever, that these are the luckiest pigs on earth, right? Because they live 
uh, in this country where almost no one wants to eat them. And obviously, if they were running around in Slovakia or something, they would much more quickly make it into a deli window. But here, uh, they're not kasher, so or even you know, for for others who who live here, they're often not of interest. <laughs> so it's it's definitely uh, in some ways good news for the animal that it's it's not a a kosher animal. And and so the flip side of that is, you could say, does that mean that like those bar who really doesn't like sheep, like? that if, he, if he's going to choose one animal that is going to the slaughter twice every day and getting completely burnt up, and, and we, we see sheep annihilated twice a day all the time in the Mikdash, does that mean that he really has it in for sheep? And he thinks that by showing us how he feels about sheep, that he's going to teach us something? And, I, and I, I obviously, the thing I just said, where it's like we should imitate the sheep, that is there too, and I, I don't want to diminish that, but I think you can look at it the opposite way and say, well, maybe there's something about these, these herd animals and perhaps especially about sheep that we don't want to emulate or that we, we can think of it, so to speak, as kind of a punishment for the species of sheep a little bit that's meant to teach us something. Um, and that in turn uh, is, is, I think, most easily, e easily connected with, again, the same quality, the idea that sheep go easily to the slaughter and, and before that, they lead these lives that are serene and ideally not very interesting, right? What they really want is just like green pasture where they can chew their cud and hang out and follow the herd from place to place. So these characteristics of just staying in your group, doing what your group does and not thinking about it too much, having a steady supply of food and just sitting and chewing your food all day and every day is the same, I mean, this may be unfair to sheep, but sheep don't, from our perspective, evoke the same degree of variegated uh, moments of different emotional and psychological experience uh, and, and, and reaction to those. Uh, it seems like they gravitate towards a life that we would look at from a human perspective and say, it's, it's kind of a meaningless life. It's a life of, of serenity, of uniformity, of conformity, you know, going with the herd. Um, and so maybe part of the message also is that Akadosh Baruch Hu is trying to show us, well, this is not, this is, this is the opposite of a life worth living. You know, if you want to think about what is going to give your life meaning, it is not being a sheep. And that's why I'm going to take sheep and twice a day, have you annihilate them for me uh, so that it can remind you, don't be a sheep. You know, you should be a nation that is not an unthinking, docile uh, member of a herd who just wants to eat and space out and wait until the end comes. And it doesn't really matter if it comes tomorrow uh, or, or 10 or 100 days later. Uh, and, and so, you know, that, that you can take for what it is. Uh, it, it's another speculation. And the last thing you would say is that same point, it, at least it, it contains also an element of a, of a certain kind of mercy for the animal in the sense that for the same reason, you don't ever have much of a sense of, okay, if a sheep becomes the Ola Tamid on a given day, that someone wouldn't very easily say about it, oh, what a tragedy, this sheep, you know, that his time came too soon, right? Uh, because in a sense, once you're especially a grown up sheep, you're just kind of waiting for, for your last day. And it's questionable how much it matters, whether it's tomorrow or, or, or 10 years from now, because either day, what you really, either way, what you really like is just to be eating grass and not experiencing too much um, emotional tumult uh, in the meantime. So those are just a few preliminary comments. And I, I think it is interesting to think about them, but what I've said so far is mostly not based much on sources and it's just kind of, uh, contemplating a, a few basic characteristics of, of sheep that um, we can uh, notice might contain some lessons of those kind for us now. So now what I'd like to do is, is go a level deeper and talk about a few different aspects that are more rooted in particular sources in the Torah that maybe do teach us something a little bit more about what sheep have to do with us uh, and uh, as a nation, as of De Hashem, you know, what are we supposed to be learning from the fact that of all the animals in the world that Akadosh Baruch who chose, he chose sheep to be the ones that are being given 
most uniformly and regularly as the kind of core foundation uh, of uh, Avodat Hashem, the service of Hashem in his temple. At the end of the day, it's about that you have a, a sheep in the morning and a sheep in the eve, uh, in the afternoon. Um, and so, why why sheep and why not something else? So, I think that I'm not going to be able to tie together all the different observations that I want to make about this. I, I, so, I, th I think it's going to be about vignettes because I'm not sure these different points are related, um, and so it may not matter supremely in what order we do them. But I, I think first, I wanted to talk about um, a related point about the Ola Tamid um, that may you know, give us a chance to contemplate this question in the right way, which is that we should be asking ourselves in general, what does Hashem tell us about what the Ola Tamid is really doing for us and for him? So he says, it is Reah Nihohi, Right, it is the the uh, pleasing aroma, my pleasing aroma that you that you give for me, right? Um, and also, it's lahmi li shai, that it's my bread for my fire. Those are two things. So in in this korbanot passage that we uh, read regularly, because so you're going to, uh, he commands Moshe uh, to make this, this regular offering, um, the Olat Tamid, and he says it's going to be this pleasing aroma, it's going to be um, a, a bread or, or food or a meal for my fire. And those two points, I, I think, um, I, I, I want to focus on. What does it mean for something to be a pleasing aroma to Hashem? And, and what does it mean uh, for something to be lehem to be bread for Hashem, but I would also add it's not really lehem for Hashem here. It's lehem leishai in the language of Akados Baruch Hu. It's it's he says it is bread for my fire, and I think that's an, an important point. So first of all, I think that the bread for my fire point may be like the the the, the simpler or more basic one. Um, fire consumes things. There is. You know, there are ample sources in the Torah that, that talk about Hashem himself as consuming things like a fire. He's an esh ochla, like a consuming fire. And that's very much associated with offerings. Uh, and so lechem, if we're thinking about what bread is, bread is something that we consume. We eat it and it's gone. And it, it becomes a part of our activity, right? It, it makes us active that we, that we uh, eat it. But it's gone once we eat it and, and sort of disappears from the world from the perspective of an outside observer. And that's certainly what fire does to things when it burns them up, right? It, it sort of disappears them. It, it, it makes them become immaterial and insubstantial compared to what they were before. So Hagadosh like, Baruch Hu is not saying, I'm hungry and I want you to feed me, so please give me a meal. That is very much, uh, that is very much the attitude of the, the pagan that, that the Torah is trying to critique through all of this. So it's not gonna say this is Hashem's bread and when we feed him, then he gives us things in exchange that we want. But the idea that it's bread for my fire, he does for some reason want his fire to be fed. So why does he want his fire to be fed? Uh, and so you could come up with different proposals about that. I don't think it's about uh, keeping a fire going. Because we have other fires in Beit Hamikdash that are like that, like the Ner Tamid, right? The the light that's from Shemin Zayit, from olive oil. Um, you know, we could keep a fire going during the day or at night whenever we want. I mean, the, the Ner Tamid is about being lit at night. Um, but it, but if if we wanted, if, if Hashem had wanted to give us a Torah saying just light a bunch of olive oil on fire all the time, just keep fires going all the time, there would be no need for for it to be thought of as food um, and for it to be an animal. So I think that the focus more is on the way that eating something disappears it, you know, makes it insubstantial and, um, and immaterial. And, and so the point is then what Akadosh Baruch Hu wants is for his fire to be taking something apart. And, and when you look at what fire does to something, it takes the material fuel, which might be the meat of an offering, or it might be wood or what have you, and 
you see it becoming less and less substantial and there are sparks and there's smoke and you can tell that it's taking something that was substantial and collected and sort of flinging its constituent parts to the four corners of the universe uh, by causing it to become more vaporous uh, and by, by causing different bits of it to sort of rise with the smoke and, and fly in different directions. And so there is a desire Akados Baruch Hu has for his fire to be seen disassembling living matter. Uh, and that is, I think, the essence of this idea of Lachmiri Shai. And then the question is, what is Reach Nihuchi? So I think that's the other side of the same coin. Again, the notion of pleasing aromas to the gods is something that fits into a pagan worldview, right? Because you can purchase things from uh, those willing to transact with you by doing things that please them. And so the pagan idea is if you give a pleasing aroma to the gods, again, maybe they'll give you some magical blessing in exchange. And so you would want to do that. Um, but I think in this case, it's, it's clear you know, from the broader uh, message of Tanakh that that's not what this is about. Instead, we have to ask, it, why is it still interesting and necessary for the Torah to say that this is a pleasing aroma? Why does Hashem, why is he pleased by the aroma? If, he, if he's not, if this isn't about, he has favorite smells and we provide those and then he gives us presents in exchange. And if instead uh, there's something else going on that still should be described as a pleasing aroma to him, then I think you have to think about what a, um, what a pleasing aroma is. Uh, a pleasing aroma uh, is, again, material that has been spread through the air and through a whole environment, right? Aromas can travel over great distances, so they can originate from a source like a fire where something is being cooked, and it can waft and float and, and convey information to the broader world. And so this is again connected with the idea of physical disassembly and sort of jumbling the pieces uh, of things uh, and sending them all over the place and creating an atmosphere, creating uh, a cloud that extends over a great territory uh, that shows that you have taken something apart and, and sent its pieces to the four corners of the world or the universe to some degree. And I think even the word nihoach, the, the pleasing aroma, it, it harkens back to this moment where Noah, you know, Nun Het is in Nihoach and also in Noah. When Noah, after he gets out of the, the Teva, the ark, with all the animals, he makes all these offerings to Akados Baruch Hu of all of the different suitable animals for offerings that he kept with him extra uh, on the Teva. Um, and so there is this element of saying, look at the example of Noah to understand what Nihoach means. And the, the point with Noah is what? How was Noah able to perform this offering? It's because he had just fulfilled a very difficult and elaborate divine command. He kept all the animals in the Teva and he saved them during the Mabul, and therefore he was able to, to make this offering. He could have made the offering before the Mabul, right? He could have had a huge barbecue whenever he wanted. That's not what happens in the text. What happens is he waits until after the Mabul, after he's fulfilled the divine command and saved all the animals according to how he was instructed with his teva. And now it's a reach nihuach, right? Now it's like a, a pleasing aroma to Akados Baruch Hu. So the point is the scattering of the material out into the world itself, the creation of the smoke out of the animal, and at that as a fulfillment of the divine command, that's what Akados Baruch Hu is enjoying and finding pleasing. It's, it's the, the fact of the fulfillment of his command and that that command uh, is itself about the, the ta taking the physical integral whole of a living thing and jumbling and scattering its material constituents uh, and spreading them out. And now you, you have to ask, you know, why, why would he want us to do that? Why is, why is it important to uh, disassemble things uh, and take them apart? Uh, and, and I think that that has to, at the end of the day, it has to do with uh, the idea of negation or annihilation, right? That Hashem creates things, he creates cows, he creates sheep, he, sheep, he creates everything in the world. And if we're being commanded, uh, specifically with the Olat Tamid, uh, to take the sheep apart, uh, then we're, we're, 
there's something about what the sheep is is representing where we're being asked to disassemble it and negate it because of somehow a a problem posed by it's remaining fully assembled. And then it's pleasing for Akados Baruch Hu that we fulfilled that command um, and, and followed uh, his instructions uh, and, and performed that disassembly according to uh, the, the rules that he laid out for how to do that. And I, I maybe this is me thinking too much like a physicist and 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 being a little bit too esoteric in, in reading uh, the Torah, but I can't help but notice something that's very suggestive uh, in, in the Torah itself uh, that hints at this, which is that amazingly, right, this mitzvah, which by the way, in a very interesting source, maybe we could discuss another time, uh, is this mitzvah, which is agreed upon in a discussion by many great sages uh, in the Talmud, is perhaps the mitzvah that stands for all the others, right, because there's this debate about which mitzvah is the most important, and uh, a bunch of different opinions are given, and at the end, we, we settle on right? That somehow this, the performance of this daily offering twice daily, um, is supposed to stand for all the others and, and, and be ultimate in its importance. That this mitzvah is about an animal for which the Torah cannot even provide a consistent spelling. So that, this is kind of a seemingly a funny piece of trivia at first, but there are multiple references, both to the word for sheep in the Torah as keves, and uh, for the word uh, uh, for, the, for sheep in the Torah as kesev, and also in plural and in singular. So there's kesev, there's keves, there's kvasim, there's ksafim, um, and uh, I haven't done a count of which is majority, I would guess maybe the Kevis is the majority, but there's really quite a few instances of Kesev and of Ksavim, not just in the laws of sacrifices, but also in, in narrative. Uh, and, and so you have to ask a question. I, I, find, I find this kind of stunning when you think about it, because yes, it's true that uh, there are things in the Torah where they become an issue of what we call Girsa, where maybe back at some point in the not too distant past, there were different Sifrei Torah and one of them had a Yud here and one of them didn't, or one of them had a Vav here and one of them didn't. Um, but what's also true is that we have an elaborate tradition of taking much less glaring details of how the Torah talks about something where each letter matters and reading things with legal implications into those differences. Um, and we have that from Chazal in many examples. And, and this is not a single instance where it kind of looks like a typo. You know, not that I would suggest that there would be anyway. I think that the proper relationship to the text of the Torah is to say this is the Torah and Hashem is the author of everything there is in, in Masa Bereshit. Uh, if he'd wanted to put an infinity of things to learn for us in Tolstoy's War and Peace, he could have done that. Um, but this is where he has taught us to look. So whether or, you know, it, the mechanism in a sense for the origin of this uh, difference in spelling of, of the word for sheep uh, in the Torah is unimportant. You, you can't ignore the fact that it's there and that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has allowed it to be there, that also whatever process that gave rise to our tradition has allowed it to be there. And, and one has to ask why, because you would think that the mitzvah that was the most important mitzvah at some level, uh, the, the fundamental performance of Avodat Hashem twice daily that represents and stands for everything else, that you would not create a situation where somehow people could say, well, are Kevis and, and Kes have the same thing or are they not? Uh, what, is, what is the Torah trying to tell us by giving us kind of static in the message of what we're supposed to do at this central moment uh, in this particularly uh, significant um, instance? Uh, and, but I, I don't think it's accidental. And I think in an interesting way, it actually lines up with what we were saying about uh, the burnt offering already, because this idea of physically jumbling the constituent parts uh, of the animal uh, and, and sort of scattering them, like taking the pieces out of which the animal is made and making them go up in smoke and scattering them to the four corners of the universe. You see the beginnings of that. Just if you put Kevis and Kesev next to each other, it's like an anagram. It's a rearrangement of the letters. It's, it's showing you it's sort of already a little bit on fire. 
that the, the letters are sort of rearranging and falling apart. Um, and I think there are different points that the Torah may be trying to make there simultaneously. One of them certainly uh, is that uh, you, you cannot understand the Torah without an oral tradition uh, and that every single thing that we think the Torah means is something that we really have to learn uh, as, as part of Am Yisrael's uh, understanding through tradition of what each part is saying, right? If someone comes along and says, well, uh, I think that Kevis means iguana, why are they wrong? You know, how is it that we know that they're wrong? It's, it's only because we have this chain of tradition that goes back all the way to, to Moshe and before where we have stability in, in the meaning that we assign to certain words. But the Torah is kind of trying to not make us comfortable with the absoluteness of how we understand that because it's showing us already a kind of a, a ripple or an instability that um, is in operation there right at the background of, of a seemingly central point. Uh, and, and so that leads in a, in a different direction and on a different day to another discussion um, because there are interesting things to ask about how we understand the authority of our texts and, and where that authority derives from. But I think that for our purposes here, it, it, it really is instead about this idea of we should be thinking about the sheep specifically and thinking about deconstruction of the sheep. Like, let's take it apart. Let's break it into its constituent pieces and think about what it consists of. And we're going to understand something perhaps profound about why the keves, why the sheep is the olatamid if we start to sort of jumble the letters, pick them apart and say, what about this kaf? What about this shin? What about this bed? And I don't really mean we should be studying the letters in particular. What I'm saying is let's deconstruct the sheep. And if we do that in the right way, in the way that the Torah is perhaps suggesting to us with this kesev keves thing, then we'll, we'll get something uh, interesting out of it. So now I, I think that what that points to is, is to just think a little bit about what sheep are and what they're for. Uh, and I, I think what this immediately, this idea of both, like why would we be commanded to annihilate the sheep and deconstruct it in a way that causes it to disappear and, and negate, you know, it to be negated. And also why we understand that by, by thinking of it deconstructively, by thinking of what the sheep consists of, the way that those two, two ideas I would argue come together is by saying sheep might be the only animal in the world that contain such a full collection of different characteristics uh, where you might like to try to represent all of nature in an animal. And this is not uh, such an accidental claim because obviously there are various idolatrous, pagan, mythic, ideological systems that have done exactly that, that sheep are very associated in other Mediterranean mythology, for example, uh, with nature. And, and the question is why? Like, is that just a, you know, they spun the wheel of fortune and they picked sheep and they might've picked iguanas, uh, but they didn't know about them yet. And it doesn't matter. You just want sort of different animal cartoons to represent your different gods. Or is there something about sheep that is the natural symbol for nature in a way that we can get deconstructively. And I, I would say it's the latter. So why is that? What do we get from sheep? Sheep are, on the one hand, food, right? You can get milk from sheep. You can kill sheep and eat their meat. Um, and, and they are, uh, in being food, even when we leave them alive, you know, they're, they're a very rich source of that. So even if you're not in the interest, you know, you're not interested in slaughtering sheep and killing them, let's zero that out. Let's think about before we're destroying and negating and eliminating sheep from the world, what can we do with them? We can get food from them because of, of their milk. They have that in common with cows, right? They have that in common with a broader range of, of kosher animals, although, um, uh, not a huge number, but yeah, sheep and goats and cows, um, you can get milk from uh, different kosher animals. But in contrast with other kosher animals, there are other things that you don't do with them um, and, and things that you 
do do with them instead. So another thing that a sheep has um, is it, it has horns, right? So there's this element of, um, there's this kind of hard and almost um, sort of uh, unyielding and rock-like or mineral-like aspect of, of what comes out of them uh, because they have horns. And again, that doesn't you know, distinguish them from cows uh, or, or goats. Uh, but I think that the last two things will. Um, so one of them is that we, we get wool from them. Um, and uh, wool uh, is this product that we can make clothing out of. It's a thing of value that we harvest from them. Um, and uh, you don't get that from cows. You can get hair from goats, uh, but it's not the same thing as wool. But even if you say, okay, fine, maybe you can make clothing out of goat hair and you can also make clothing um, out of, uh, you can make clothing out of uh, sheep wool um, without killing the animal. Uh, but the last thing I think you would say is you can't use sheep really to, to do work for you. And maybe you could even argue that it's conceivable you could get goats to kind of pull a cart around or something. That's happened a bit more historically, but sheep are really just not good work animals. Cows definitely, or um, or bulls are much more so. And so I think if you're looking at the uniqueness of the sheep, it's that keeping the sheep alive, it's not a work animal for you, but it is uh, this kind of source of bounty that it just kind of stands around. It produces food for you. It produces clothing for you. It produces a hard substance out of which you can make tools and implements. And so it has this, this quality of animal and vegetable and mineral, right? Like the wool, you could think of it as sort of like a, a crop that you harvest. It grows on the animal, you shear it off. There's this, there's this sense in which it's, it's like a field of a, uh, a, a sort of fabric uh, or, or plant-like substance that grows in it that you can, you can harvest in the way that you grow um, crops in a field. It also produces milk and milk is very much the animal essence of life. So it, it feeds you in that way. And then it has these, these horns um, that you can uh, drop off and that you can use to make tools out of that are kind of rocky and hard. And so I think that it's not actually so difficult to say that the same way that the earth is, you know, plant and animal and mineral, and it's not this thing that works for you, but it's this thing that just kind of sits there and can be cultivated and therefore will produce different kinds of useful bounty for you, uh, that it's not such an accident that people have associated sheep with nature uh, and nature in, in sort of a positive or deified light um, at, in a variety of, of, of different ideologies or, or mythic systems, particularly in, in, in the ancient Mediterranean. And if we, if we focus in on that, that is, I think, the point where we say, okay, now we maybe start to understand a little bit better why we were being encouraged to sort of take the sheep apart and think about, all right, these are the horns and think about um, this is the wool and think about this is the milk. These are the things that we're getting from the sheep. Uh, but also that we realize when we put it together and it becomes this emblem of the, the, the bounty of nature, all the different ways we can relate to nature. We can cultivate crops and then the earth produces them. We can find edible substances um, that, that maybe come from animals instead of from plants and, and we can eat them and be nourished by them. We can make tools out of things that we find um, in the world. That if the sheep does represent this whole package deal of how the earth and how nature is this source of bounty for you, that certainly must be something that there is ideological value for us as of De Hashem in annihilating, right? Because what temptation could be greater than wanting to worship uh, an emblem or a representation of every way in which the whole world in which you live uh, can help you to flourish and prosper and survive by its nature, right? That uh, has been a large part of the basis for idolatrous worship of nature uh, since time immemorial, you know, and we can say certainly in the ancient world, 
and perhaps resurgently uh, in the present day, this is a, a very deep attraction uh, for the human psyche. And what HaKadosh Baruch Hu may find it centrally important to, foundationally important to do in the Mikdash is to provide a constant message uh, that despite the fact that there is such a thing as nature, there is such a thing as the world, there is bounty in the world, it does provide us with minerals for tools and, and plants for making fabrics and, and uh, also getting food from them. And it does provide us with animals uh, to, to nourish ourselves with further. But there are these different kinds of emblems of, of things that are, it provides for us. Kadosh Baruch Hu needs to remind us that all of that is just an assemblage of his. It's just a creation of his. It's just something that he put together and that he also can take it apart. And that by being his servants and sometimes playing a direct role in the disassembly of that, according to his command and according to his will, we are reminded that there's an ultimate thing that we are serving that is immaterial and transcendental and beyond all of that bounty that he has created for us to partake of and for us to enjoy. And that's part of our, our flourishing here in the world. The Mikdash is a very complicated place because it is on the one hand associated with the agricultural production of, of the land of Israel, both in terms of livestock that we bring there and in terms of you know, the, the, the fruits of the land that we grow. Uh, and there are, are even things that are said in the Torah and, and elsewhere in Tanakh about the role of the Mikdash uh, that sound, that the remind us in a sense that if we keep Hashem's Torah, then he wants to give us great bracha, he wants to give us great blessing and, and flourishing of all sorts of kinds in our land, in our livestock, in our fruits, you know, and, and grains, et cetera, that we can produce with the land. And so, and, and, and indeed, uh, we learn in Tanakh that Harabait itself was a threshing floor before it became uh, the, the site for the Mikdash. It was a place where grain was being threshed, where you, you count your grain after your harvest, after you separate the wheat from the chaff and you figure out how much you're really going to have to make flour. So there is one sense in which Akados Baruch Hu doesn't want to say to us, I, I promise you nothing in this material world. I only promise you a kingdom of heaven in the next world. You should just suffer and be miserable in this world and self-abnegating and self-annihilating. And then there will be some immaterial existence afterwards where accounts will be settled. That is a different view of the world than what the Torah uh, elaborates. What the Torah elaborates is a view of the world where there is reward and bounty and success and flourishing in this world in connection with our keeping the Torah as a nation. But the moment that you bring that into the story, it becomes this very dangerous temptation to kind of forget the motivation and the focus and the ultimate purpose of your, your worship and your avodat, avodat Hashem, because you start to focus on the bounty as the goal in a sense, right? That it starts to be that maybe the Mikdash is just sort of a good harvest machine where we go and we do these magical rituals and that makes our harvest good. And we do them because we want a good harvest uh, and we're not really so interested otherwise. And that slippage, that uh, misalignment of intention of Kavana is a perpetual danger. So at the center of everything that we're doing, what HaKadosh Baruch Hu is doing is he's taking this this emblem uh, of the productivity and bounty of nature and, and planet Earth as a whole um, that to anyone in the ancient world would have said, oh, that's sheep, that's, that's nature in a nutshell, right? And, and, and saying, take this and take it to pieces. Uh, I, 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 want, I will be pleased by the disassembly of all of this and, and the, the desubstantiation of it for it to be made immaterial, for it to vanish, to go up in smoke, so that you are being reminded that material bounty, although it is something that is promised and it is part of this, this package deal of, of the, the Brit, the covenant that we have at Kadosh Baruch Hu, it is not the point. The point is service of Hashem. And if Hashem wants you to take all of that and annihilate it, um, then your 
privilege is to play the role uh, of performing that pageant as well and, and to, to be the one who, who fulfills the divine will, um, even in an instance where it's about negation of uh, the natural and negation of the material and negation of the bountiful. So that's a, uh, th that could be a concluding point. I just have one um, additional brief uh, point to, to layer on top of that, which is that another direction we could have um, come from in, in thinking about why the Torah is so interested in sheep in particular when it comes to Korbanot, it's narratively explored uh, perhaps best in the situation that we see towards the end of the plagues in Mitzrayim where Moshe uh, is about to provide for Bnei Israel the, the final mitzvah or commandment at the time of the striking of the firstborn of Egypt, which is to do Korban Pesach, to, to slaughter a lamb, to paint his blood on the door, all of those things. And there is a discussion at that time of how that, uh, that performance uh, is, is dangerous, that it's, it's not something that it's easy to pull off uh, in Mitzrayim, because Moshe says that it is, a, uh, it is an abomination to the Egyptians uh, to, to perform this slaughter of sheep. So he's saying, well, they're going to want to stone us because in Mitzrayim, you just simply can't slaughter sheep. Um, and uh, this is somehow uh, a fundamental thing in their society that this kind of behavior is not allowed. And that presents kind of a puzzle to us. And it is the starting point of our identity as a nation, that we're this nation of shepherders, which you really see when, when the Ivrim, when Bnei Israel, like the sons of Yaakov, go down to meet time first, because even at that time, they're told that it's a toy vai, it's an abomination for the Egyptians to, you know, have to, to sit and eat with shepherds. There's something about shepherds that is very antithetical to what Mitzri society uh, represents. And then what Moshe is showing us is that it's the slaughter of sheep in particular, that is kind of the problem. Um, so I, I, think there, I think there is um, an element related to what we've been saying about, about nature and its bounty that perhaps can be understood by thinking about the role of, of sheep in Mitzrayim, which is a very puzzling one um, uh, when we are only being given these, these cryptic psukim, just saying this is something the Mitzrayim have a problem with. But I think that the way, one way you can start to think about it, and I, I am a little bit reluctant to try to make the case in this way because I don't think that we should only understand the Torah because we somehow have uh, archeological evidence about ancient Egypt uh, that, that makes something make sense. Uh, but, but it is a point that, that does come out of there. And I, I think that maybe you can try to make this case from the text on its own as a speculation, at least. We may have seen uh, or, or you may have seen uh, times when Egyptian pharaohs are portrayed holding this kind of like curved stick. Um, uh, and uh, this curved stick uh, is sometimes understood uh, to be a shepherd's crook, right? That the, the paro, the, the king of Mitzrayim, was somehow in his role as the sort of highest priest of Mitzrayim and their, their absolute dominating ruler, he was portrayed as being a shepherd. And, and that is a very interesting piece of data in connection with this idea that at the same time, shepherds are anathema uh, in Mitzrayim and they, you're supposed to keep them separate um, uh, from, from, the, from the Mitzrayim, it's an abomination. And also, you know, you can't slaughter um, sheep around here. So, so what is this exactly? What does it mean that on the one hand, herding is a thing, like people have the concept of what a shepherd is in Mitzrayim and Paro is a shepherd, but you can't therefore bring shepherds into me time. And, and I think what, what it may be is this, that to some degree, what Paro was saying was, I am your shepherd. Like we say, you know, in Tehilim, Adonai roi lo echsar. Hashem is, our, is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the Egyptian idea was not that Hashem is the, is the roe, is the shepherd, but rather that Paro is the shepherd. And you even see the word, Ro'e in paro, right? It's like pei reish ein hei. Reish ein hei is ro'e. So um, ro'e means shepherd. 
in biblical Hebrew. Paro is the name for um, uh, the king of Egypt that's given. It contains the word shepherd. You also see a lot of resh ein associated with Mitzrayim, like Ramses has a resh ein in it, and also um, uh, the word ra, you know, which we usually translate as evil or bad, um, pops up frequently talking about all the sort of uh, attempts at getting Bnei Israel out of, out of Mitzrayim. Um, and, and I think that this word Ro'e as, as a shepherd and, and the Reish Ein, uh, that theme running through having to do with Mitzrayim, may, you, know, you could argue, kind of authenticates this connection of shepherding um, with Paro himself, you know, that, that he has the word shepherd in his name. So why would Paro be a shepherd and why would that be kind of a problem? It's because if Paro is the shepherd in the Egyptian ideology, then what is he saying? He's saying, you're the sheep. He's saying to the Mitzrim, you're my sheep and I'm the shepherd. I know what's best for everyone. And your job is to respond to my gentle little nudges that try to help everyone to go in the right direction and do and perform their role. So I'm in charge. I see it all. I know I'm standing behind you and sort of guiding you to the right place um, as a shepherd does with his flock. And what you need to do is just follow the herd and listen to me and do what I say. So I hold the shepherd's crook. Now, what is the problem with that? That if that's how Paro describes his social contract, he of course would want to emphasize to the people that he is a roe who simply in a gentle and repeated and nonviolent way harvests the bounty that the well-functioning herd produces, that he, he milks the sheep and he shears the sheep. Um, and perhaps when the horns fall off, he you know, will make tools out of the, the sheep horns or whatever, but he doesn't slaughter the sheep, right? Because if, if you include that in the image, then that is a much more disturbing idea to a Mitzri, to an Egyptian. If his idea is like, I'm a sheep and, and Paro is the shepherd, you don't want to see portrayals of shepherds slaughtering their sheep. Because that reminds you that if you're the sheep, then sometimes you're the lamb to slaughter. Uh, and it is obviously a destabilizing idea in Mitzrayim to, to put out there the idea that Paro is our ruler and we are the sheep and, and his, he's the shepherd. And sometimes he's just going to come and decide that he's going to eat you. Uh, and, and maybe then you're a little bit unable to follow that metaphor all the way to being a docile sheep and cooperating. But if you just don't let anyone slaughter sheep around you, um, then what Paro can do is be this, in fact, a brutal and merciless predator who works people to death and does all the things that we know Paro does. Uh, and, and he can prey on his people and he can prey on all the slaves that are the, the, the basis for his society, including the Yivrim. Um, but uh, he can get away with that by putting out propaganda that says, I'm the shepherd, I'm holding the shepherd's crook, and I'm just snipping off a little bit of the wool, but I'm. But you never see shepherd slaughter sheep. It's not allowed, it's against the law. It's a toy va in our, our society. Don't hang out with shepherds who might tell you that sometimes they eat sheep. Um, just learn from me, you know, the, this sort of child's cartoon of, of, of what your role is in the society. And so I, I think that that ends up locking in neatly into what else we were saying about negation of nature, because whether you're saying that uh, the, the purpose of the Olatamid and the centrality of the sheep there is to take the representation of nature and its bounty itself and negate it and annihilate it and show your fealty to Hashem by saying uh, that you're there to worship him not in order to get the bounty, but perhaps in order to cause it to dematerialize, if that is his command. There's also this element of uh, that you, you understand that Paro is not the shepherd, but rather that Hashem is the, is the ultimate shepherd, and that it is part of Hashem's message for us um, that he is ultimately in charge uh, and that he uh, arranges the events of his creation uh, so that sometimes according to his will, uh, life begins and sometimes according to his will, life ends. And he's not doing it for his own benefit. He's not doing it because he's hungry in the way that Paro 
or a, a human shepherd would do uh, by slaughtering a sheep in order to eat it, um, but rather that he's doing it uh, because of the opportunity uh, that our uh, participation in this pageant gives us uh, to show him that we understand uh, his supreme role over nature uh, and his uh, his role as our shepherd uh, and as the liberator uh, that uh, saved us from Paro. So uh, it may be that, uh, that these two streams really run in a bit different directions, um, meaning that, that the story about Paro and, and, and considering sheep as representations of nature don't entirely fit together. Uh, so they might be two separate commentaries that you have to kind of look at one at a time. But I think both of them are there in the background of, of this question of, of why sheep and, and not other animals. Um, and they're certainly there for us to pull out of the Torah um, uh, to, to see some deeper meaning uh, in, in this mitzvah. Any questions? I was just going to make a comment on a general type of level that perhaps one could, um, if one is to take the line of interpretation, which we're, uh, we see that the sheep is representing nature and the bounty of nature. And then we're sort of taking it apart, showing that in some sense that the real reality of the world is the spiritual reality. Isn't there a, a similar type of theme we could connect to something else very holy that we do, Yom, Yom Kippurim, when we withdraw from food. In other words, that's also a, on that day when we when we withdraw from food, um, essentially we're, we're disconnecting on some level from the material world as well. We're, we're pushing it away on some level and emphasizing the spiritual over the physical. I'm just saying there's some, I see some general thematic uh, overlap. That's that's all. I don't. Yeah. Um, no. I I I think that there is a connection there, and you know, at the same time, in Yom Kippurim, also you have the the special mitzvah of the Azazel, which involves um, a goat, or really two goats, one of which you know uh, that by lots are, are selected, each to have a role. One of which is going to be an Ola, like the Ola Tamid, that's going to be um, burnt on the altar. In the mikdash, and the other one that gets sent out into the into the midbar, into the desert. And um, I haven't thought much about. Well, I, I think th there's a different shiur we can have where we talk about. Okay, so now all the different animals, like when the, when there is a mitzvah to to do a seir instead of a keves, or to do a ben bakar instead of a seir, like all the different, you know, a bull or a goat or a sheep. There are different elements in in the narratives uh, of the Torah that those can be referred to, and and I think seir is more more associated with sin, um, perhaps, and, and maybe that may be a reason why that becomes the one for, for Yom Kippurim. Um, but I, I definitely agree that um, there there is an element on Yom Kippurim. You know, by not eating, we're certainly trying to strain towards some notion of we're not concerned with what we're getting in exchange, uh, right? That, you know, 364 days a year, uh, we are uh, concerned in a sense with uh, making sure that we can survive. And part of that is eating and we rely on Hashem to give us the bracha that we need for that. But one day where we're thanking him for sparing us, uh, our, our sparing us from being annihilated, um, and always and they're promising to always save us as a nation, we we withdraw from that material uh, dependence and and affirm this idea that somehow it's about something that is um, a, not uh, directly connected with the bounty that we we sort of need him to provide. But I the only thing I would say in addition to that is that, I always try to tread very carefully about talking about the difference between what we call the material and the spiritual, because I think that uh, there, there are concepts in authentic Torah that do 
explore those differences, but I don't think that they are as uh, different as we sometimes make them out to be. Like there's a there's a dualistic way of thinking about it where you you could say there's a spiritual world which is non-physical, and there is a material world that is physical, and both of these things matter and somehow interweave. Uh, and as soon as you, you make that division, people start leaning very heavily towards thinking what really matters is the non-physical. What really matters is the, uh, the immaterial and spiritual. But I think that that's a very Greek or Christian full separation if you really try to divide those things and put them in separate boxes. And we have that all over our tradition, like, for example, in, in this um, uh, Agadah um, in, I think, Masechet Ta'anit, where it's being discussed um, in, in the Mishnah, um, uh, maybe it's not in Masechet Ta'anit, but in any case, it's about Tchiat Mitim and resurrection, and there's a, a mashal, like an example given of the king and his orchard, and uh, hiring someone to guard his orchard, and he hires a blind man and a lame man, um, and they, they co collaborate, and the, the blind man um, puts the lame man on his shoulders, and they steal the fruit together, and so the king afterwards, in order to judge them, puts them together. He puts the blind man and the lame man one, together, one with the other, so he can't judge them separately because they each couldn't have stolen the fruit, so he unifies them, and he judges them together, and so we're, we're taught that by, by our sages that Hashem wants to judge us body and soul together. So even though we desire to speak of the idea of a nishama or, or nefesh, like the, the, the soul-like concepts, that they don't have a separate standing when not combined with the body to sort of matter or make a difference. Um, and, and I think to me, the, the way that that becomes most relevant thinking about some of what we were talking about disassembling the, the physical materials of things is that I don't think it's about a non-physical and a physical world. I think that is very Greek dualism. I think what it's about more is that there are some things that are very substantive and there are other things that are still physical and material, but are much less substantive, right? Like smoke and air and wind and aromas and breath, all of those different things they become the physical things in the world that provide uh, a, a basis by analogy for talking about things in the world that are not very hard and are not very localized and are not very tangible, but still are part of the truth about the world. So uh, I, I don't think I see as much in our tradition, certainly if you're reading, you know, Humash and Tanakh, like you're, if you're looking at our most fundamental sources, all the words that we have for um, spirit or soul, they refer to things that are also material and also physical, like breath or wind uh, or steam, etc. cetera. Uh, and, and I think that there's this very strong reluctance in our tradition uh, to really fully acknowledge the separability of these things. But what it's saying is, look, think about the wind, compare the wind to a rock. A rock is, here, you can grab it, you can hold it in your hand, you can throw it. It's very hard, it's very well-defined in its boundary. And the polar opposite of that is a wind where you can't even really see it. You don't even know which directions, which parts of it are going in unless there's some snow or some leaves that are blowing around. It can carry aromas or other kinds of information to you from very far away. It's, it's, it's mysterious and it's very correlated with itself in ways that you can't necessarily see where you don't really know when the wind is blowing, how much the fact that the wind is going down here in that direction has to do with the fact that the wind is going up there in this other direction at the same time. But that's all on the one hand, something you can think about as a physicist and it's not immaterial, but it is a very different space of analogy to be in than when thinking about rocks and when thinking about bones or, or, or the, the most um, tangible uh, and blocky and, and, and simple parts of, of our physical existence. So I, I agree with the point that you make, but I do think that um, I wouldn't, if we're going to use the word spiritual, then I would want to make sure that the word spirit is like the word ruach in Hebrew, which is like wind, 
And it's not to mean immaterial so much as, or non-physical so much as more to mean that sometimes what Hashem wants uh, to be brought about in the world is scattered across the world in ways where, you know, you can't initially tell um, what one part has to do with another, but it's still part of his plan, right? Like that the aroma, the fragrance of the burning offering extends across an enormous space and it relates one place to another. Uh, and it, it relates, uh, it, 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 it conveys different parts of the sheep, so to speak, different molecules of the sheep to different places. Um, and so it, it's this, this sense of the, the holistic correlation of, of many parts of the world with each other, which is the polar opposite of one substantive thing in one place and, and totally absent from another place. Uh, and so I, I think it's, it's, I agree it's the right point, but I, I, I think I, I would um, make sure to tweak it in the direction of not dividing between the physical and the non-physical and saying more that what we call the spiritual is about holistic relationship of events extended across space and time, as opposed to these kind of focused and separable, tangible things um, that we usually try to relate to in everyday life. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Dr. England. My pleasure as always. Okay, good night. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Haim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz activities in your local area, Please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.